Good evening and thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Family Matters. Over one million people around, one billion people around the world live in informal settlements or slum and this is equivalent to one in every four people in the global urban uh, population. So during this time that governments are adopting some measures involving lockdown restrictions and social distancing, we just want to understand how possible are these restrictions, especially in informal settlements. And let's have that conversation using the hashtag Family Matters KBC. In studio tonight, we have Beatrice Otawa, who is the programs officer at Polycom Development Project. I understand you deal with, you respond to some of the issues uh, in slums, especially for women and girls and then next to Otawa is the lovely Wairimu Salome who is a student and a peer mentor during this time schools are closed she just chose to educate her peers on why they need to stay safe during this time that is a noble cause for you and thank you so much all of you ladies for joining us tonight mm -hmm. Thank okay, so Salome, um, let me begin with Beatrice. Beatrice, mm -hmm. before we talk about COVID-19, let's make our viewers understand uh, how life exactly is. And when you talk about informal settlements, what is that setting like? Uh, what the setup is like uh, in the informal settlements, first we have the houses, which are 12 by 12, and they are very squeezed. And in these houses, you will find uh, a household that has... Uh, probably a minimum of uh, four people living in that uh, same same house. Some can be as many as eight living in that uh, same same one room. And when it comes to again to the families uh, who also have uh, girls who've grown up and are now adolescent girls, their parents also get f have to get an extra room for the girls to be sleeping in that room. Mm -hmm. So that again comes with more expenses to the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, how possible is it to get an extra room as you're talking about for girls who are already, even boys mm -hmm. who are adolescent? Uh, possibility in terms of finances, it's quite uh, restraining on uh, the parents because financially you find that uh, the families, most of these families, uh, they do odd jobs. They go to the well of families and uh, we call them the mamafua. They go wash clothes and from that at least they get to put something on the table. For some, they go for the kazizam jengo and with that they're also able to sustain their families. So you find that uh, these houses, they vary. There are those that are made of uh, the mabati and the, those that are just uh, how how will they explain it just the mud mm. mud houses mm -hmm. so the mud houses will be slightly cheaper than the mabati houses mm. yeah Salome, you are an adolescent, if I'm not wrong. You, you can tell, you can try explain what Beatrice is saying, life as an adolescent in the informal settlements. How is that like? Okay, the life is quite hard because like you are in that, the same house, and you are grown up, so like everything you do is in the same house. But at times it becomes hard because some things you need to do when you tie back, and your dad is there, your mom is there, your brother, so it becomes more hard. Mm -hmm. Data shows that one in every four people living in urban mm -hmm. setups mm -hmm. lives in slums. So this means there is the issue of densely population in informal settlements. Of what challenge is this? Not just to, to the response of on COVID-19, but to getting resources and of course living. How does this affect livelihoods in people living in settlements, informal settlements? Sorry. In terms of getting resources, uh, uh, if we break them down, for instance, uh, health-wise, uh, getting access to health uh, centers, yes, we have the health centers that are there, basically, but uh, the numbers outdo the centers that are already there. So you find that uh, most of the people, what they will prefer is just go to the chemist and get uh, the off the drug counters. And another thing is the issue of the schools. Uh, the public schools are not so many in the informal settlements. So we have community schools coming up, so many of them. Uh, like for instance, in Kibera Polycom, we work with uh, 50, 50 partner schools. And in these 50 partner schools, uh, there are only three public schools. The rest are community schools. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
that kid who's coming from the informal settlement as much as that kid who's coming from Kileleshwa or Runda, they all need to go to school. So he'll go to school, a school that doesn't have all the necessary resources that are needed in that school, but at the end of the day, the joy of that kid is to get an education just like the rest of every other child in the country. Salome, where do you go to school? And is what Beatrice is saying that uh, people who go to school, especially in informal settlements, don't get every necessity that other uh, uh, students or pupils in other schools get? Is that a challenge to you? Yes, of course. Like when I was in primary, um, I was in a private school more so. But we used to go for like mathematics contests in uh, public schools. And it was really hard because the students in public school, they are more squeezed and, they, and their numbers are to do the numbers of a private school. So it's, it's kind of squeezed. Yeah. And actually both uh, Beatrice and Salome are based in Kibera. Yes. I yeah. forgot to say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beatrice, uh, tell us some of the challenges that apart from the issue of uh, housing and infrastructure, let's in general talk about the, some of the issues or challenges that uh, people living in informal settlements deal with. And the organization is dealing with women and girls, is it because they are more vulnerable? Uh, yes, it is because uh, women and girls are more vulnerable, more so when it comes to issues of uh, sanitary towels. So many girls in the informal settlements do not have access to these uh, sanitary towels. Yes, the government uh, has the initiative of giving uh, public schools sanitary towels, and uh, we thank the government for that. But uh, in as much as they're doing that, they're not able to reach each and every person. And as an organization, we also make uh, uh, sanitary towels, which we also distribute to the women and the girls. But again, at the same time, we are not also able to meet the whole uh, uh, the whole community to reach the whole community, and then another issue is on the issue of uh, water. Water is a major issue, even before COVID, because uh, people in informal settlements they buy water, and one jerry can of water, when there is good supply of water, the twenty liter jerry can will go for five shillings, and when there is no water, it goes for as much as uh, between thirty and forty, forty shillings. So uh, that is a major uh, issue that you're facing. And also the bit of when it comes to the surrounding being clean, because we have very many dumping places. So with this many dumping sites, then there's the issue of typhoid, mm -hmm. cholera, and even the water that we get to access. Mm -hmm. We are not 100% sure that this water is clean because at, as uh, the, pipes, the pipes end up going through the sewer lines. So you can be jumping over a sewer line and inside uh, <laughs> that uh, sewer line, you can literally see the pipe that uh, is supposed to be bringing water to the different uh, water points passing through there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I say, and people do survive. Mm -hmm. I will say that, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. Salome, as a girl who's been born and raised up in an informal settlement, maybe you can paint a picture for us on some of the challenges as a woman that you're facing as you're growing up uh, in that setup. Okay, first and foremost, like um, when I was in primary school, like the to access a pad before I came and joined Polycom, it was really, really hard because one pad could cost 80 shillings, and so your parents could wonder if they buy food or buy for you, but so you really had to struggle or use something else. Um, it's, it was really hard, but when Polycom came and other organizations, they really solved some issues in, the, in Kibra mostly, because now let's say 90% of the girls can access pads and their parents can limit the money mm -hmm. and maybe do other things with the money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Allow me to be more direct to you mm -hmm. before the support mm -hmm. uh, came in from all the organizations. Mm -hmm. How exactly were you surviving as a girl in terms of access to sanitary towels? Okay, it was really hard. Sometimes I could use like the kirakas mm -hmm. and um, maybe when you they buy for you a pad, okay, your parent co could tell you that that could last for two months or three, and it was really challenging because 
some girls go for like one week, three days. So you could wonder it consists of 10 pieces and you have to go for it with three months. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard. Okay. Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. COVID-19 in March, it was reported and scientists and experts are saying the old and people living in informal settlements were, were at risk mm -hmm. of getting the, or being co or contracting the virus because of the population that you talked about. So when this news, we, we got this news that especially it was announced that now it's here in Kenya, what was your worry as an organization or someone with a project, working on a project in an informal settlement? Our uh, first uh, worry was um, the girls. Mm. How are they going to get access to the sanitary towers? Their safety, how safe are they going to be? Uh, and then something else, uh, are we going to lose people, uh, uh, people that we've known, girls that we've known due to COVID-19? And then the other issue was the bit of water. We lack water. So the government is telling us we need to wash hands uh, a number of times. And yet the water that I'm supposed to, to be even be using at home, I don't have it. So the question would be, where am I going to get this water from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Salome, I'll ask you the same question. COVID-19 is here in Kenya, and reports from the minister are coming out that people living in densely populated areas, especially in informal settlements, are at a higher risk of getting this disease. What was going through your mind? And at that time, were you, were you in school or at home? Okay, the day that they announced that COVID has arrived in Kenya, I was in school. So we came back home, but we didn't know when we were going back to school. So the question was like, that informal home, you have to study and it is a one home. Okay, you, your parents need to watch the TV, you have kids. So it was really challenging for me to get a time to study. And like, if we say that you just wake up at four, like the usual time at school, so you don't have to light on the electricity because mm -hmm. it will distract your parents or something. So it has really been challenging and yeah, challenging to me mm -hmm. because the time of getting to study at home, it's not, efficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. And were you scared that because now people living in informal settlements have been cited or listed as being at a risk, were you scared that you could get the virus, you know? Yeah, I was scared because there's a time that they said Kibira was now the victim. Yeah. yeah. I was really scared because you couldn't stay with your friends, you had to keep social distance, stay at home. And the same same people are the people you grew with, so it was really hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll get back to you and ask you how you are protecting yourself. Okay. But uh, Beatrice, mm -hmm. then there was the issue of the protocols, yes. you know, social distancing, staying at home, mm -hmm. wearing the mask, I this hygiene again involved in water. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the issue of social distancing because of the population is a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Let's begin with the social. I, I don't know, or even water. Let's begin with the so when when this. Um, restrictions were announced by the government mm -hmm. that you need to stay at home, keep a social distancing. What is going through your mind that this may not be possible in this setup? Okay, what went through my mind at first was uh, stay at home. Stay at home, what will I eat mm -hmm. while I'm staying at home? Because most of this, uh, m the larger community in the informal settlements, they earn daily they get their daily wages. So telling them to stay at home, that wasn't going to work. And then social distancing. For instance, with the houses, uh, this is my house, my neighbor's house is just next year, and the other neighbor, we are facing each other. So social distancing was next to impossible. Because mm. even in the corridors where they walk while they're going home, you won't tell someone to, you guys just stop there as these people pass, no. At one point, we'll just have to be converging, have converging points. And uh, it's, it's, it's been uh, really hectic. And also on the issue of masks, because when the masks uh, first came, not so many people knew the fundies. Not so many tailors knew how to make it or how to design it. And then we had the disposable ones that were really, really expensive. Mm. So the question was, how are people now going to survive? And then we had the kids. The kids cannot stay home. For them, this was just 
like uh, something that they've never experienced before, staying at home, doing what? Mm -hmm. And the only person that they will sit down and listen to will be Mutahi Kagwe, who everyone else had termed, to, uh, termed as um, the COVID guy. So kids are all over the place. They're not staying at home. They have nothing, they have nothing to do so. I, in, and in the process, so many things end up happening. And then with the issue of water, we even had um, the uh, area wards, uh, admins, forcing each and every person, if you had a shop, to have uh, a hand washing station in front of your shop. And if you didn't have it, there were threats of the shops being closed. Mm -hmm. The first few weeks, people did comply. Even if you would go to Mamamboga, they will not allow you to touch the tomatoes. Uh, but uh, with time, uh, there was that bit of, okay, no one is dying in Kibera, so this thing, it's not really mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. It's just for others. Mm -hmm. And the others being those guys who stay in Kilimani, Runda, and wherever, but not amongst us. Mm -hmm. But again, when we started hearing that uh, prominent people, people whose opinion are held close to the youth heart were taken in for quarantine, and then people took a back step and started thinking, so this thing is real and it can get anybody. Mm. But in as far as, in as much as it can get anybody, but at the end of the day, we need to put uh, food on the table. So we need to go and hustle. Mm -hmm. So even when it came to issues of the curfew time, because in the evening is when most people will do their sales. Those, the mamambogas, those who prepare their parties on the roadside. But now with the curfews, now the businesses came to a standstill. Right. Mm -hmm. It must have been very disturbing uh, for you, Salome, mm -hmm. when you heard that Kibera was now one of the hotspots of COVID-19. Tell us more about that. Okay, the day I heard that, so we were more specifically like, like the, at this time you should get into the house and we had the police, they could throw tear, tear gas, they could beat the poor outside. So in that commotion, it, it really triggered my mindset and thought how will the COVID, uh, what, at what time will it end? Because at, during that time, um, the, the, let's say the Mama Boga that time, he, she or she was selling his things and the police came and found her there outside so they threw the, her things and she could get a loss. So it was really shocking to me and I, I could really hate the, that time because mm -hmm. let's say my mom was the one selling outside and her things were thrown and she could now start from the scratch again. And that business was the one feeding us, maybe paying my school fees or the rent. So it was really hard mm -hmm. and shocking at mm -hmm. that at time. At the same time, yeah. seven mm -hmm. months on Beatrice, mm -hmm. um, the numbers are not so high as expected in informal settlements mm -hmm. and there have been a lot of support from well wishers especially on the distribution of masks uh, you know hand washing points mm -hmm. how now of, of the people are people there adhering to these COVID-19 restrictions or what would you say has kept these numbers at bay <laughs> <laughs> well uh, I would say that's that's sort of a tricky question yeah. because uh, seven months down the line the hand washing stations are dry. There's no one who's passing and they're being, literally the first few weeks, someone will literally be forced to wash their hands. But right now they just pass express. And the hand washing stations, they don't have water. Mask wearing, uh, we recently had some people who had come to visit us at the office. And they were shocked that when they uh, are delighted at the main stage, people in Kibera are without masks. Mm. Life is normal to them. And again, uh, there are organizations that have come on board and assisted even with the masks free of charge because people will not afford masks. Because if you get your 30 shillings, that 30 shillings you will prefer for it to buy for you vegetables you and your family as opposed to buying the masks but uh, with organizations such as uh, Uweza Foundation who have been able to tailor make the mask and uh, distribute them to each and every household 
so far I can say that 85% uh, of households in Kibera have been given masks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Up to now. Up to now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Salome, let me now get to your project, what you're doing currently. You are mentoring your peers. Uh, is it because of what you just uh, said that the numbers are increasing and of course uh, businesses are being affected? What let's talk about your project. What exactly are you doing? Okay, I do mentorship program to my fellow youths or girls. And um, what inspired me to start it because the mentors who used to mentor me when I was in primary could inspire me and sometimes they could call me in front also to okay, give something or mentor the other people that you are in the same room. So that could inspire me and each and every time I got an opportunity or a time, a free time, I could go to the office, ask what I can do or something I can do. So they gave me an opportunity to, to also mentor other girls. So they are the people who inspired me mm -hmm. and gave me the platform to mm -hmm. start it. Yeah. And wh what exactly, uh, how, how are you mentoring them? Is mm -hmm. it in regard to education? Uh, staying safe, w what does a program or project involve? Okay, it, it generally deals with both. It can be life skills, how coronavirus has infected them, and how s school staff like that, and sharing how their lives have been since the day we came back from home. We came back from school, sorry. So it's generally all the same, yeah, mm -hmm. everything. Since we came to back from school, that yeah. was in March. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that is from March till now you're still at home, uh, in living in informal, an informal uh, setup. What challenges are you encountering right now as a student now? Okay, like, okay, t let's say that I've stayed like home for like seven or eight months, of which I could be in school, I could have learned a lot. And something that also is affecting my mind thoughts that uh, next year I'll be repeating my the, my the same class and maybe I had plans after my form four next year but I'll have to repeat it again so when I came back from school it was like I thought I was going to just stay at home like for one month but it, I was shocked that the time that they, we could return back to school was not mentioned yet so it was really hard to get the time to study the time to do with home staff, the time to also get time for your peers and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lastly, let me stay with you. So um, in de it's indefinite when schools will be reopened. Mm -hmm. What are you doing as a student? Are you still studying? I know you mentioned it's very difficult to mm -hmm. do that, especially at night because you do not want to disturb your siblings and mm -hmm. your parents. What exactly are you doing right now as a student apart from the mentorship program? Okay, like studying you get your free time, you do online studying because with, with the book stuff, it will really be hard because um, some subjects like biology or chemistry or something, you need to be explained more. So reading to yourself is really hard. And basically, that's the thing I'm doing. And also I've joined a youth group that deals with also, they go visit the children's home and the group is known as Spread a Smile. So that's a youth group that they took their time to create that group so that the free time they have, they can go talk about some things like studies, how they will improve with their studies and all stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, Beatrice, let mm -hmm. me ask you, and it's a broader question, but what impact has exactly COVID-19 had in people living in informal settlements? You mentioned that women and girls are more vulnerable, especially in women and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me take the aspect of the women, mm -hmm. more so the expectant mothers. For them, this has really been a big blow because initially before COVID, the women will go for their ANC, antenatal care, and even go for the postnatal care. But uh, right now during COVID, they're, they're scared because you're scared that uh, if I go to the hospital, I will end up maybe being tested for COVID and test uh, positive and if that happens then you take it for quarantine or isolation and then what next for yourself and then the other issue was that even uh, when it comes to delivery it's been a bit of an issue because even when they go for the ANC the way you used to be normally checked if the baby is okay if you as a mother you're okay 
it certainly turned to something different. All you had to do was give your card, the doctor will go through it and give it back to you. And then you, you're done with your cleaning. So the thinking is, so does the doctor really know if I'm okay or not? Or what is it that he has written on the, on the, the clinic book? And uh, the other issue is on uh, issues of security. And when it, I'm talking security in terms of the girl child, so many, we've had cases of girls being defiled. So it's, it's quite scary during this uh, COVID period, issues again of uh, uh, gender-based violence. And with that, we'll bring on board, uh, kids are now mentally, they're not well, and they need that uh, mental health when they're going back to school, because parents have been having issues because of lack of finances. And the only way that they can let this out is through the kids. And the kids, when uh, recently there was an issue that a uh, case that we were handling of a girl who's in uh, class uh, seven and uh, the mom left the, them alone. The dad also is not working in Nairobi and when he sends money, he sends money through Mama Pima. And then Mama Pima will definitely will on will give them fifty shillings, and this fifty shillings is supposed to cater for their meals, to buy water, and uh, there are three other kids who are still looking up to her, and the last born is a toddler. So with such a girl, and when you see her, she's so fragile, and she needs that family support, but both parents are not there to do that. So as an organization, we are trying to see how we can be able to. Uh, help some of these girls uh, go through the whole issue. And COVID-19 has, again, really, really sort of hit people badly such so that even when uh, the roads were opened up, right. mm -hmm. people went rushing back to their rural homes. Because mm -hmm. here you are staying in someone's house and you've not paid rent uh, for the past three months. So the landlord will come, either break the door or lock it with mm. uh, three or four padlocks and you're left outside there with your kids. Mm. So the impact has been very, very severe and also on the bit of employment. Because with COVID now, the mamas who used to wash clothes can no longer go and wash clothes. Mm -hmm. Hence, they're not able to put food on the table. And the girls are now being requested that uh, you're old enough, you can also go and look for money and put food on the table. Mm -hmm. And where are they going to look for that? It's probably from the men who are out there. Mm -hmm. You'll go selling yourself so that you're able to put food on the table right. for your family. Yeah, from what you've said, Salome, the challenges that you've encountered, especially as a student, you're not able to study. Uh, wh wh what do you think should be done maybe to have a level ground between you and the other students in the other parts of the country? Okay, like we saw last time on the television that they said the school might open, but at this time, like there are some kids that their parents, maybe they have organized for them to have tuition, and it will not occur, occur to many people because some of them, their parents are not able to pay for them their tuition and all stuff. So maybe that the, the tuition maybe could be limited and mm -hmm. they could say that we'll do maybe a free tuition of which they will limit the time and the social distancing mm -hmm. and the number of students per class. So that we could really help so that they could really get back to the books and refresh back on what they learned or the what, what they want mm -hmm. to learn. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. I'm told we have a minute left, maybe mm -hmm. in that uh, minute you can tell us now how best should, because we're still into the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So how best, uh, what is the best response for this disease uh, or pandemic, especially in informal settlements, in a scale of one to 10, the way the government is responding to this pandemic in informal settlements, how would you rate it? And what, how best should it be done? Uh, Personally, I would uh, rate it at uh, six because the government has done quite a lot because uh, we have uh, water being given to residents uh, free of charge. And then uh, the other thing is that uh, even as residents of the informal settlements, we are there to what the government has put in place. And with that, we will indeed keep ourselves safe mm -hmm. and uh, 
post uh, COVID-19, we will end up uh, having something that we know that this taught us one, two, three, and then we've learned from it. Mm -hmm. And also on the bit of the education aspect, the government ought to rethink, because so many of these uh, kids in the informal settlements have not gone through the online tuitions mm. or the online teachings that were going on. Okay, mm. Beatrice, we'll have this conversation again, but I thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Salome, for your time. I appreciate and I hope all will be well, especially in the education sector, and you will not have to repeat yeah. form four, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, ladies, for coming. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank mm. you all for watching Family Matters tonight. Si time is not on our side, but I'll be having a look at your feedback off air. Thank you once again for making time for us. I'm Purity Museo and Byron Abuli has been a sign language interpreter tonight. Do have yourself a lovely night and enjoy the rest of the week ahead. <laughs>